things you just can't unsee. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Rick Ferguson. I'm the Artistic Director of the Musical Offering, and this is actually the first in a series of three presentations uh, specifically having to do with women composers. Uh, we did this last year. We, we sort of uh, like navigated various COVID timings, and we were actually able to get all three presentations in. So that was that was great. Uh, tonight is lecture recital about Florence Price, obviously. On the 29th of this month, we're going to do a chamber music concert. Uh, music of Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel, her piano trio. We're doing uh, music of Nadia Boulanger. We're doing music of Evanston bass composer Stacy Garrett who is a good friend of mine and an absolutely fantastic composer. So we're going to be focusing on that. Then on Saturday, November 5th, we're going to do our uh, presentation concert of the winners of this year's Young Women's Composition Competition. And I'm very excited about that because this is the third year that we have held this particular competition. Uh, young women ages 12 to 18 middle school, high school categories. And this year, we've really got, and, and actually, I'm, I tend to hyperbole sometimes, but this is actually not the case this time. We've gone international. I have gotten, because yesterday was the, the deadline for all of the submissions, right? And I've gotten uh, a number of, of course, local submissions, uh, including like Nichols Middle School, ETHS, you know, that, that kind of thing. I've gotten submissions from uh, kids in Ottawa, Canada, uh, Redmond, Washington, uh, Tehran, Iran, which I'm very excited about, several from Singapore, several from Beijing. And so our efforts to really post this on international sites where, where young composers tend to look for various opportunities, it seems to be gaining some traction. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to say before we dive into Florence Price is uh, I want to make sure that we acknowledge Evanston Arts Council for really supporting this series as they did last year. And it really allows us to go a little bit deeper as, as a faculty. And in this particular concert, we have a mixture of students, alumni, and faculty, uh, which is something that I really enjoy putting together. So, uh, so that's great. So thank you for being here, and uh, let's talk a little Florence Price, shall we? Um, Florence Beatrice Smith, born 1888, Little Rock, Arkansas, died 1953 in Chicago. Tremendous Chicago presence for decades. Uh, she was known when she was young, up until about, oh, age of 13 or 14 is B. So she went by B, uh, for those who knew her well, uh, Florence for those who didn't. Um, and you know, when, when I say prodigious talent and formidable intellect, 
uh, the more that I've been learning about Ms. Price, it, it's just, if I were to choose the ingredients for an ideal mentor, somebody to really look, look up to, which I've been fortunate enough to have, it really would be someone very much like Florence Price. The reason being that so much of her work really resonates deeply with me in terms of her love of teaching, her creativity, not just around composition, but also around music instruction. So her work as an educator was really significant. Uh, she was born to two highly educated parents, both of mixed races. Uh, Mom was from Indianapolis, dad was from Camden, Delaware. And was, as soon as she could read, which I think was pretty darn early, she was a absolute and voracious reader. Her dad had in their home uh, in Little Rock a huge library, and apparently B would just love to spend hour after hour in the library reading everything she could get her hands on. At the same time, she started piano lessons at the age of three. Her mom was her first teacher. I'm not sure how long that lasted. My mom was my first teacher. That didn't last that long. So, so uh, I, I certainly commiserate with that. But she actually played her first public concert when she was four. And you know, at that time in Little Rock, there weren't, of course, a lot of nicer hotels that would accommodate uh, you know, black people who were traveling through and traveling across the country. So actually, their home became a crossroads for a lot of uh, musicians, poets, writers, actors. And so, you know, young B was exposed to all of these kinds of personalities when she was young. And I think it had a, a tremendous influence on her. Uh, she ended up graduating high school as valedictorian of her class at Union School in Little Rock at the age of 13. At the age of 15, she was accepted into and went to study at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. Uh, at that time, it was one of the, the, the few, maybe one of the only schools that would admit both women and African-American students. And so she was lucky enough to be able to do that, and boy, did she make use of her time. She graduated in three years. She graduated with two degrees, one in piano pedagogy and the other in organ performance and composition. And you know, when she was a student there, apparently she was the go-to organist to premiere works, not only by faculty, but a lot of her fellow students as well, in addition to writing a lot of her own organ music. But it was also at this time that she really started to, I think, find her voice as a young teacher and to, uh, I think, solidify a lot of her ideas about piano teaching specifically. And when she graduated from NEC, she went back to Little Rock. She got a job at Shorter College in Little Rock where she served as the music coordinator for the entire music program there. And bear in mind, a lot of black colleges during this time were not just colleges. It was K through college. And so she was in a position of having to create a curriculum for that entire span. I know, it's crazy, right? Yes, yeah, that's good. Yeah, And so she did that a couple of years after that, her father passed away. And so she decided to see if, if there were other opportunities. She went to Clark University in Atlanta. And she did the same thing there, but I think really had a lot more freedom, more resources to work with, and was able to, I think, really start to uh, formalize a lot of her ideas about teaching, including the composition of a lot of instructional pieces. Now, you know, there's a, a huge, wonderful tradition of composers creating instructional pieces, certainly for keyboard instruments. And uh, as far as we know, at least at this point, and the scholarship is, is still very much evolving and fluid, I'll get to that actually at the, at the end of the lecture, um, she wrote, I think, somewhere around 70 instructional pieces, all the way from like very basic, which we'll hear an example of, uh, through much more demanding sort of pre-professional level pieces, right? And 
one of the things that I love about her teaching was that she taught through the use of narrative. So a lot of her pieces would have very descriptive titles where there's an obvious narrative element to what's going on, and I think she was able to really engage the imaginations of her students through narrative as they were learning technical skills, musicality skills, all those kinds of things. So I very much appreciate that aspect of her teaching. Um, later on in life, after she had lived in Chicago for several decades, she started, uh, she moved into the Abraham Lincoln Center in Chicago, which for a time was an artist commune. And apparently she had upwards of 70 students at any given time that she was working with. And I think it was during those later years in her life that she really solidified her legacy as a teacher. Because now there's so many people, you know, who either studied with her or studied with somebody who did study with her. So a lot of her ideas about teaching have filtered out into the, into the broader pianistic geeky ether. And so it's, it's, a, it's really a, a wonderful legacy from a teaching perspective, right? So I thought it might be fun to, uh, to hear a couple of examples of some of her teaching music. So Steve has, I think, a very good example of what would be like an introductory basic piece that she would be giving some of her early piano students and then, uh, then we'll hear Mary start to get into music that has a little bit more of a clear narrative to it. Okay, Steve.
the, her Tarantella is a piece that she published in 1926 initially. Um, it was, it then went for a long time out of print, but has now come back into print. And one of the reasons for that, I, I love these like the fingers, I'll talk about it at the very end of the book. This is actually a really good story, it's very good story. So uh, in case you aren't familiar with the Tarantella, it is based on an old um, Italian sort of late Renaissance dance where, for some reason, certain Italians believed that the bite of the tarantula was poisonous. And so if one were bitten by a tarantula, one should immediately begin dancing in circles very quickly, <laughs> right? And so they needed inspiring music to assist people to dance in circles very quickly until they would exorcise whatever they were going to exorcise as a result of being bit. So now we've got the, the tarantella. And it's, uh, it's actually a, a really wonderful form. And it's very nice, uh, I think, in, from a compositional point of view, how Florence Price, and, and I'll get into this a little bit more with some of the other pieces, but how she is able to incorporate a lot of that, that language, especially pianistic composition, of this whole like post-romanticism era, you know, 1920s, 30s, leading into the Second World War, and, uh, and then throw a lot of her own elements into it. So very, very particular style. <laughs>
So, Volga works. Um, in terms of creating community, you know, the music world is sort of like a, a small, weird little cosmos in itself. And especially during the 1920s up until, you know, the time of the Second World War, um, what I've discovered is there was an amazing community of black musicians because, you know, they had to, of course, be, be in a position to support each other to try to move uh, you know, black American music forward and really to sort of like create their own language and their own identity as they then also try to make, with a lot of success, uh, inroads in to becoming sort of more mainstream within American society. So, uh, you know, that, that was no mean feat whatsoever. Um, in terms of her vocal writing, you know, you can see on the, on the back page where I list representative list of, of her works, she wrote a lot of songs. She wrote a lot of songs, a lot of choral pieces too. And she also has uh, some music for small vocal and instrumental ensemble. So she loved the voice. She absolutely loved the voice, but I think more than that, she loved poetry. She had a long time relationship with Langston Hughes. They corresponded, uh, they got together where, whenever they could, and she set quite a number of, of his poems, uh, both Marian Anderson first, and then later Leontine Price, they just loved her vocal writing. And so in a lot of their own recitals, they would tend to program uh, Ms. Price's songs, and uh, I, I think really helped to to popularize a lot of not only her own writing, but you know a lot of black songwriting. And one of the things that I personally have found that with, with the spirituals tradition, with more mainstream art song, she really, in a lot of ways, transformed that particular style of compositional writing. Uh, she recreated a lot of the harmonic language around traditional spirituals and sort of expanded how I think a lot of concert goers uh, perceived the traditional spiritual. And it's really just brilliant composition, absolutely brilliant composition. So you might want to check out some of those. Another, uh, another poet that, uh, that Ms. Price was very close to was the poet for the song we're going to hear, Mary Rollison Gamble. And uh, her poetry was, uh, during this period of time, wonderful about painting pictures and then working very closely with Florence Price, sort of bringing a lot of that idea about using what's going on in the piano to somehow paint what's going on in the text. AJ, would you say that's, that, that's right? Right? And so, uh, you know, one reason that I chose this particular song, I thought it was, first of all, I just love the poetry. Secondly, I thought it is a really good example of how much subtlety is in the piano writing, but uh, how much color there is in the piano writing and what vocal, wonderful vocal writing it is, too. Right? So let's hear Love in a Mist. song and, and us playing and singing it together there it's almost like a series of little vignettes that pretty um, easily move through different segments of the voice so the areas that are in the passaggio all kind of stay in the passaggio those are their lower stay lower and so it's like a very um, vocally friendly way of going through all of these different pictures that she's painting with the text but also making it very accessible for Especially, I was when I was going through this, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to assign this to like some voice students, especially like high school and early college, because it's so vocally friendly for all of these different areas that you're figuring out with your voice while still being really like a fun piece to sing because it tells a really fun story. So, character development, yeah. right? You yeah. Know, like, who can <laughs>
is the musical version of that, the musical iteration. You know, there were, there were playwrights, actors, musicians, painters, poets, writers, like, you know, fanning, literally fanning out all across the country, uh, especially in smaller communities where you didn't tend to have easy access, of course, to, to a lot of live art, uh, creating live art. And this went on for several years, and uh, Florence Price was a part of that whole and a part of what she did during that time was spend uh, a good bit of time and energy and creativity in Detroit. And that eventually resulted in her third symphony being premiered by, in 1940, the Michigan uh, WPA Orchestra, which later became the Detroit Symphony. Right? But before that, you see in 1933, she actually had her first symphony premiered here by the CSO. Uh, first black woman to have a symphony played by a ma major American orchestra. Uh, second black composer, the first, I just love these tidbits, the first being William Grant Still, I believe in 1930 is, is Afro-American symphony uh, premiered, I think in New York. Um, and he was also from Little Rock, Arkansas, seven years younger than Florence Price. They grew up together, they knew each other, they corresponded and supported each other for years and years and years. So I thought that that was sort of a really nifty little thing, you know, the connection between Frederick Stock, Chicago Symphony, Florence Price, 
and then uh, you know later going on and and sort of moving uh, symphonic writing uh, in in Michigan and helping to uh, initially form the Detroit Symphony. So that's uh, that's sort of a neat thing. And there were this is just one example of so many wonderful things that came about as a result of what was going on uh, during that era of of WPA projects. Uh, musically and otherwise, of course. Um, during this time, too, she she wrote a particular piece for piano and orchestra. It's her piano concerto in one movement. And this is, I think, probably more than any other piece, her vehicle that she used herself as a pianist um, and sort of not only put her on the map as a composer, but also as a performing musician and it, it, uh, it still is played, thank goodness, a whole lot these days as we're beginning to have a little bit more uh, interest in her music. And there's a really good reason for that that I'm going to talk about it right, right at the end. Uh, to a lot of her music was premiered by women's orchestras. And I've heard some recordings. There, there were at one point in, in time, I think as you get like well into the 1930s, around 100 women's orchestras in the U.S. Because, of course, women couldn't be in, in the, you know, in orchestras. And so, well, of course, they formed their own. And uh, the one in Chicago, the Chicago Women's Symphony, uh, they actually had for several years, I think, uh, a regular uh, radio broadcast. And so you were able to hear what was going on. And so you were able to also hear music by women composers on these broadcasts. And that's just such a brilliant idea and so sneaky, such a great way to sort of like skirt around, you know, all these other restrictions that were in place. So that's just one of my favorite things ever. And, uh, you know, she was able to actually hear a lot of her orchestral music uh, played live because, of course, you know, she did not have MP3s to refer to when she was writing her music. So, so she was able to actually hear it played during the rehearsal process uh, with various women's orchestras and then refine and, uh, and then try to get her music played in larger venues. One, one very good uh, example with the Third Symphony. Oh, oh yes, uh, Evanston Symphony is going to be playing her Third Symphony at the end of October, so you should totally come come here. I'm going to be playing the Celeste. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. <laughs> um, what she was able to do in terms of making inroads to have having her symphonic music played more widely, you know, it it met with only a limited amount of success. You know, of course, Frederick Stock, as I mentioned, was a big proponent of American composers because at that time there was a, a huge bias against music written by any American composer. Um, and so that was sort of a big deal in itself. There was also uh, Serge Kusevitsky in Boston, and he was a, a big proponent of American music. And so uh, Florence wrote to him over the course of, I believe, four years, never got a response, wrote a rather, I, I think, spicy letter, <laughs> and got, got a response from his assistant. If you send us a score, uh, Kusevitsky will, will look at it, and uh, sent the score, and then got a reply back from the assistant. Um, you know, he's reviewed this, your score and we're not going to program your symphony at this time, right? So there was a whole lot of that kind of thing going on. And so that continually put uh, Florence Price and, and other composers in general, of course, but especially composers of color in a really difficult situation to just try to be very creative and persistent about uh, finding avenues to have your, your music played. So, uh, you know, a lot of her music started to be played by college and university and conservatory orchestras, right? They would find these different ways to create relationships and, and make these things happen. Um, at the same time, she was very busily playing and writing for the organ. And so her symphonic writing and her organ composition, they very much paralleled each other. And, you know, if you talk to any organist, 
they'll basically tell you why you don't need a symphony, you've got me. <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, you know, she was able to do a lot of coloristic things uh, with her organ composition that she would apply to her symphonic writing and the other way around as well. So I thought we would hear a couple of examples. Uh, first, the, the, her adoration, which is perhaps her best known piece for organ, and it certainly has been arranged for all manner of different instrumental combinations, including orchestral music, but uh, in, in this case, we've got violin and piano, and I think it's an absolutely lovely arrangement that Miss Price made. So Molly's going to share this piece with you. A, uh, a musical meditation. Mm -hmm. It really reads. of the organ to create interesting like symphonic texture. She did the same with the piano as well, um, and, and I tend to like it better. Uh, a lot of what she was doing, and one reason I wanted to specifically 
use this second movement, the slower movement of her piano sonata as an example, it is a great example of the fusion nature of her compositional style. So you're going to hear, uh, you know, like more traditional spiritual oriented melodic writing, but, you know, I'm hearing so many other influences in this music, including the music of Edvard Grieg. Uh, just, you know, a lot of that, that uh, later romantic uh, coloristic style and her lyricism is absolutely fabulous. But what I want you to listen for is how she's able to create uh, changing moods as she goes through, progresses through the movement, but using various uh, registers on the piano to mimic certain kinds of symphonic related sounds. And I think she does it really effectively in this particular movement. So I hope you enjoy it.
child of the piano. And you know, at this particular point in time too, when she was writing a lot of this music, uh, piano transcriptions were all the rage because of course everybody had already figured out well the piano can do anything basically and so you know that was a wonderful vehicle for a pianist to be able to explore a lot of repertoire not as if we're like hurting for repertoire on the piano but to uh, explore a lot of repertoire outside standard piano repertoire and uh, I just love her writing you know and it's it's so incredibly pianistic um, Okay, now this is fun. Chamber music. She was a wonderful chamber musician herself, uh, both as a pianist and sort of a really good amateur violinist as well. Um, and her favorite piece of chamber music, I've sort of listed here, and you might want to go check it out, uh, Five Folk Songs in Counterpoint for a String Quartet. And these are all very spirituals-based pieces but she, she sort of takes the quartet through their paces, and it is a compositional masterclass in how you work with contrapuntal composition. You know, like very two or more voices, of course, sort of in dialogue with each other. Well, here you've got four voices um, trying to weave their way in and out of uh, treatments of traditional spiritual tunes. And it, it is absolutely brilliant. It's, it's one of the, I think, most creative uh, American quartets that, that I've heard, just the concept of it. And it's a great example of this idea of various uh, elements coming together that on the surface don't necessarily seem to have a lot in common with each other. But when you put them in a blender, you get something new. And, uh, and it's very exciting. Uh, I just love this. Now, I've, I've talked, I've mentioned here George Chadwick, Antony Dvorak, and the Nationalistic Movement. Okay, this was very impactful for her because George Chadwick was the director of the New England Conservatory while she, while she was there. And uh, he was a composer, very successful composer himself, and he was a huge proponent of an American identity in music that composers should figure out what uh, an American style of composition sounds like and then get busy doing it. And he uh, always was a huge champion. As a matter of fact, on scholarship, he gave Florence Price composition lessons for free, although he really didn't do that. But apparently he made an exception in this case. And uh, I think conceptually had more of an impact on her feeling like, yes, I now have validation from somebody like this. I really want to go and fully like, explore my uh, identity as a composer and see where that leads me, right? Uh, at the same time, a little bit earlier, Antonin Dvorak was the, uh, he came over uh, from Bohemia to New York City and was also the director of a music conservatory in New York City and of course, you know, we, we all know about his time here. Well, one of the things that's a little bit less known is his championing of an American style and the fact that Dvorak also had, I think, up to a dozen uh, black students as composition students. And so behind the scenes, you had all of this wonderful support going on for the creation of a black identity in American music. Uh, that really started in the 1890s. Um, and, and I thought that that was absolutely wonderful. So it's this idea of, specific to Miss Price, her creating her own musical style by finding various ways, depending on what the composition was, of, of fusing these disparate elements together. And I think a really good example is her G minor fantasy. Rachel, we're still doing it in G minor, right? Okay, All right. It is, is her G minor fantasy for violin and piano. And one of the things that I think is, is really nifty about this piece is the basic scale is just your basic minor pentatonic scale, a five-tone scale. Right? And so you're going to hear that sound flavor the entire piece. And the thing about the pentatonic scale is that in one form or, or another, it tends to be present in all um, indigenous types of music, 
You can find pentatonic sounds in Indonesian and, and Bali gamelan music. You can find it all throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, a lot of Native American music is based on pentatonic sounds, right? So you see it all throughout the world, and it's, it's sort of a, a basic sound structure or a set of notes that in some ways seems really familiar on a very deep level, and she uses it to great effect in this particular piece. You wouldn't even necessarily notice it, but now you will because you're listening for it. <laughs> Thank you. 
don't want anybody to leave without sort of stating something that's like really obvious or it should be if you're paying any attention at all. We got one kick-ass faculty here. <laughs> So now for the thing that I've been alluding to. <laughs> if you look on your on your second page, hidden music. So Riverwood was a summer home uh, in Kankakee County that Florence Price had and spent several summers there with two of her daughters and was able to sort of get out of the city clear mind and spend some serious time composing. And, and that was the case for, for quite on and off for, for a number of years. In 2009, uh, a couple, the, the Gatwoods, they purchased a number of properties in Kankakee County. Uh, and there were a number of homes on several of these properties. They were going to rehabilitate them, flip them, and, uh, and do, do that whole thing. Um, they went in to one of the homes that obviously hadn't been lived in for, for decades. Tree had fallen in, uh, sort of like crashing in the ceiling in a part of the house. There was water damage, all kinds of things. They went into the living room of this house. There was an old piano in the corner. And then uh, against the wall next to the piano, there are a number of boxes. And, and not just two boxes, I mean boxes, right? And so they go over and they look in these boxes and they see handwritten music manuscripts. And they're sort of thinking, why in the world are there handwritten music manuscripts in these boxes? And they begin to look through them and they notice that, you know, there, there, there are songs, there are piano pieces, there's symphonic music, there is at least one violin concerto. We're talking like dozens and dozens of pieces of music, all signed Florence Price. They have no idea what to do with this stuff. And so they get online and begin like Googling, right? And what they do discover is that the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville has a collection of a lot of Florence Price's correspondence, a lot of her other music manuscripts, and is actually at the forefront during this particular period of time, and it's still the case, in trying to bring a lot of her uh, manuscript music into good quality digital print. And so we now have, because of this completely weird, bizarre happenstance, we now have up to about half of her output, and she wrote over 300 pieces. We would not have access to this music if the Gatwoods had not, A, bought that property, most likely, sort of took the time to see what was in the boxes, and then make a connection that maybe this has some value to some people. Right, and then found where to go with it. Right, and so the uh, University of Arkansas, uh, their music library has uh, been creating a wonderful database of information about Florence Price. And just a couple of years ago, uh, we now have FlorencePrice.com, which is a really nice website. And you can go on not only to get information about her, her life, her works, but you can also then donate to a foundation that is specifically trying to get much more of her music printed and sort of more in the public sphere so that it can be played and heard and sung, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's really just a wonderful thing. And so I think what's happening right now is that gradually we're having more and more of her music played and heard and sung, and we're getting access to more and more uh, of her works and really able to enjoy them and to see what an incredible body of work she actually put together, oftentimes in very challenging circumstances. So, that's my lecture. <laughs> I'm not going to know the answer, but you can ask him and I'll make something up. I'm happy because you know when you leave, you're going to, oh, I wonder if I'm right. So, Rick Ferguson, Mo at Gmail.
<laughs> just, just email me with questions. But thank you for coming. Do we still have things out? Of, okay, so go get stuff to eat and drink out in the lobby. Thank you. And thank you to Rachel. Thank you to AJ. <laughs> thank you to our virtual knitted alumna, Molly. <laughs> and thank you to our student, Steve and Mary. Good job, guys.